<coughs> is it working? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming to, to the seminar. Uh, I am going to introduce Takemasa, and I should need a, a piece of paper because I am very proud to say that 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 I was his advisor, uh, but I, he has gotten so many prizes <laughs> after that, that, that I, I probably will need to, to sit and, and look at, at this. But I would like to say, uh, Takemasa was very kindly given two years to get a master at, at the University of Maryland, and when I started working with him, I said, wow, he's so good that I, I, I told him he should work hard and try to complete a, a PhD in those two years. And, and he completed a master and a PhD and, and went on to other uh, triumphs. Uh, he, he became, was selected as an uh, assistant professor on uh, a few years later, and and then he was invited by uh, an organization in Riken, who were the largest uh, scientific uh, uh, centers are, are, are in, in Japan, uh, and where they have a, a supercomputer, K, that is going to be eventually replaced by another even stronger supercomputer. So he was asked to, to direct, uh, organize first, and, and then direct uh, uh, a data assimilation group. And she quickly uh, gathered about 15 uh, super, very good scientists, many of whom have uh, done their, their own PhD with Takemasa as, his, as their advisor, and he, he got some very good prizes like, like uh, Awarded every year to only three scientists, then and uh, back in, in 2013. And also got the top uh, most prestigious award for meteorological success in Japan. When he, after five years, his group was. Didn't get outstanding, but he got extremely outstanding <laughs> as, as a, a, a review. So, uh, I don't get to say more except that I would like to, to emphasize the state that told me six weeks to do the data simulation. is breaking every barrier of data simulation science. Here I speak of luck here about what you are doing. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for many people, these many people coming to this seminar. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about what we have been doing in Riken, that's a, a research institute in Japan, um, what we call Big data assimilation, a new science for weather prediction and beyond. So let me first briefly introduce, okay, it is, it was working, but not now. Okay, can you move on? Okay, good. So first, uh, introduce myself, although Eugenia, thank you, Eugenia, <laughs> giving a very nice uh, introduction. So, as Eugenia said, well, 
I spent two years at the University of Maryland, but before, uh, as a graduate student. But before that, I was a JMA employee. Um, JMA is the weather service in Japan. Right after I graduated from Kyoto University. So I didn't go to a graduate school in Japan. And instead, I started working for the government. And this is the time when I started uh, developing the 3D VAR system for mesoscale, a uh, new mesoscale system at JMA. So that was in 2002. And then I had a chance to study at the University of Maryland with Eugenia uh, in 2003 and for two years. And they, so their requirement was to get a master's degree in two years. But as Eugenia said, I finished a PhD. And then I went to JMA again to, so I, my research for PhD was about the ensemble karma filter. And I started the development of the ensemble karma filter with the Japanese um, operational numerical weather prediction system. And then it was uh, 2008, the end of 2008, I decided to uh, go to Maryland again and as a faculty member. And I spent for four years, exact four years, and then I again uh, went back to Japan. And this weekend is a research institute in all sciences. So they are strong in physics, biology, and chemistry. They are not strong in geoscience, any geoscience. But uh, I started this data assimilation research team, mostly focusing on geoscience. And there is another uh, research team focusing on the model development for weather, weather models. So we are the only two groups in Riken. Riken has 3,000 scientists, and we, our two has maybe 20 or less working on uh, geoscience problems. So I have been leading this um, data simulation research team at Riken Center for Computational Science, where we have the largest supercomputer in Japan. And the scope includes not only meteorology, but also a broader uh, applications of data simulation. That's why I'm going to talk about meteorology, but beyond meteorology. Okay. So this is the computer that we have. This is already eight years old. I think the age of computer, like this uh, high-end supercomputer, is like one year uh, may corresponds to like 10 years of human life. So eight years old, meaning 80 years old in human life, so it's time to retire. So they already decided the date to retire. That will be, I forgot the exact the date, but it's middle of August this year. So this has a life less than half a year from now. So when I went to Japan six and a half years ago, was still new, like 10 or 20 years old in human life, and really the, the, well, the fastest was number one supercomputer. And I was thinking, because my job at that time is to think about how to use this computer and to make something new. Um, so this is old now. Uh, we are planning to develop the next one. So after this retires, uh, we will start implementing the next one. That will be as powerful as 100 times of this supercomputer. So we are now waiting for that. OK, so this is my group. Um, now we, we are a group of 14 scientists working on various problems of data assimilation, but mostly focusing on numerical weather prediction because of my background. So again, I thought about how to use this computer. And my colleagues in Riken had this simulation in 2012. And this is 
uh, global model at 870 meters resolution. So this is still the highest resolution, even though this simulation is like seven years old. Um, I think that there are people trying to do higher resolution simulation, but still this is the highest resolution. So that if you have the next generation computer, I believe that we will have even higher resolution global simulation. Okay, this is great. And this is 870 meter resolution. And it's already published in 2013. On the other hand, we have new technologies for the observation. This is the actual image from a phase array radar. So this is three dimensional image. Every 30 seconds they take the whole sky um, scanning. So we get this every 30 second image, almost like a smooth movie. And this is really amazing. So this is a phase array. So we take 100 vertical levels simultaneously, while the regular radar like this takes only one level. That's why we get 100 times of more data. So we have a big computer. So the question is how to combine these two. So that's what I thought at first when I had this uh, new data and also the large supercomputer. So the data simulation is something to connect the observation and the model. So we have a high resolution model and this uh, 100 times of more data. So we combine these two and process all of these big data with this supercomputer. So that's what we call big data simulation. So every 30 seconds we get the data, and every 30 seconds we assimilate the data into the model. The model at a 100 meter resolution. And we run 100 ensemble members to represent the uncertainties. So we have a range of uncertainties, and we get every 30 seconds. So this is a case that we tested. The first, um, one of the two first cases that we tested this system. So I saw this image on uh, September 11th, 14. Um, I live somewhere close to this dot, and my office is there. And I bike to the office for 30 minutes. And I looked at this image from JMA, it's a weather service, and I decided to bike. Um, as you can see, that this developed very quickly. And in 30 minutes, it became like this. So I'm a PhD in meteorology. And I'm supposed to be a good weather forecaster. Um, well, it's impossible to predict this rapidly growing system. And this affects a lot of people living in Kobe. This is a big city, a million people living in this area. So uh, this has a major impact in the city, although there's, there was no disaster reported. And we, so that's how, why we chose this case for this um, testing this system. So we simulated this heavy rainfall system. We also have the observation from the phase array. So every 30 seconds, we have the observation. So we start at 8.010. And every 30 seconds, we get the observation. And this data is assimilated into this simulation. So this is all the others are from the computer. And this is a simulation without the data simulation on the bottom left. So this will move. So we have this, but it takes time to catch up. So it takes time like, like 20 minutes to catch up. But every 30 seconds, we get the data. That's how we can catch up. So without the data, we have no predictability at all. We cannot predict this type of event if we update the state every hour. But every 30 seconds, we get the data, and we just feed the data into this system. Then we get this really nice uh, structure of the observed precipitation system. So the red part corresponds to more raindrops and heavier rain. And blue part, uh, the less uh, reflectivity, that means we have fewer uh, raindrops. 
and we can also see these clouds. The clouds are invisible from the radar, because the radar is not sensitive to these small droplets. But we can see this because the simulation contains all variables. So we can even try to fly in, even though we cannot do that in the real world. So that's the advantage of the simulation. Okay. So this is nice, and uh, I will not play the whole movie, but this is available on YouTube. And this is now ranked number six of Weekend Channel. The Weekend Channel has more than several thousand content. And this is ranked number six. I'm very happy about that. So if you, so if you can kindly click, <laughs> we can increase the digit probably in the second digit. Um, try to beat the higher, <laughs> higher rank. OK? So again, the observation have some noisy patterns, because we have noisy observations. Or we may have some missing values. So the observation may have some missing parts. But the data simulation can interpolate those missing parts or the noise, the smooth out the noise. So we have a nicer pattern. We assume that these are closer to the real world than the observation. And Without the data simulation, we cannot predict this event at all. So this worked very well uh, for this case. And we tested in other cases. And all the cases showed a very promising result. We are very happy about our results. So people might ask if this um, kind of prediction for the next 30 minutes or so will be useful or not. But we had this event actually happen in Kobe in 2008 in the summer. This river like this became like this in only in 10 minutes. This is the actual uh, picture. And this became like that in 10 minutes. And some people uh, couldn't escape. And five people unfortunately died in this river at that time. So if we, at that time, we didn't have any warning system in the river. After this event, the Kobe city government implemented some sirens and warning systems. But we need to have prediction to make it more useful. So if, even if the prediction 10 minutes for 10 minutes will be useful, it's really a matter of the, the life. Okay. So the data simulation is like a bridge connecting between observations and the numerical model. And we add the value. So uh, what is important here is the simulations are based on the process. So we describe the process as the equations of motion. And then we solve it in the computer. That's how we can predict the future. So this is process driven. And observations provide the real world data. So we need both. And each has different strengths. So data simulation tries to combine this data-driven approach and process-driven approach. So without the process, uh, we can just learn from the data, and we can build the data-driven model to predict the future. But uh, that cannot predict the extreme events, because there is no experience in before. Then there is an extrapolation of the data-driven model usually doesn't perform very well. So the process can produce something that we have never experienced before. So this is the idea of data simulation. Shu Tian and, and Eugenia and other people uh, proposed a very nice idea to combine well, the idea of chaos synchronization and data simulation. And I really like this uh, concept of uh, chaos synchronization to, to describe what the data simulation does. So we have a nature system that we don't know perfectly. We cannot know perfectly. But we have some understanding of the nature. And based on our understanding of the nature, we, build, we can build a model. So we have a model to, to mimic the nature. And we have some limited information transferring from the nature 
to our models made by the observation. So this is also not perfect. The observation should be noisy and also imperfect. So the question is, if we can synchronize the behavior in the model to the actual nature. So that's what we have been doing in weather prediction and other applications. So this problem of synchronization is equivalent to understanding the stability of this synchronized state. So we have a nature moving and we cannot control. Let's assume that we cannot control the nature. So we have a model that we can play with and then we have some information passing from the nature. Then we synchronize the behavior of this model to the nature. If we can synchronize it, um, we have a better estimate of the nature and also we, we have a prediction of the nature. So we cannot control the dynamical instability of the nature. So this try to separate these two. But we can control our observation system. So what I showed in a moment before was the very rapidly growing system, weather system. That's the convective weather system. So that grows very rapidly. So even 10 minutes is long. So that's why we needed to have very frequent observation. So we assimilated um, every 30 second observation. So that was good for the rapidly growing system. But for the synoptic weather, once in six hours or 12 hours will be good enough for synchronization. So it, it really matters what kind of dynamical instability or what kind of the chaotic dynamics that we are trying to predict or estimate. And then we need to design our observations accordingly. So if you have rapidly growing system, then a rapidly changing system, then we need to observe more frequently and more densely and more accurately. So that's how we can uh, make these two couplings uh, strongly. Okay, so this is a general concept of chaos synchronization. And I, I didn't know what kind of audience today, uh, so I prepared some simple uh, example of uh, synchronized chaos through data simulation. So let's consider this simple system. So this n, let's assume that this is time. So time n to n plus one, this is a model. So if we give us some number here, we can compute this given a is four. So if we give 0.2 here and a is four, then we can compute that the time two will be 0.64. And then we can compute the next one and next one like this. And we can do the same thing for this different time series. So this is a small noise added to this point too. And if you, if you look at here, for example, uh, 15, the time step 15, so it's point zero 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 nine. So it's almost zero. But here it's point zero 0.05. It's very different. So if you make the plot for this blue time series and red time series, the red is on top of blue. So we see that the red is really on top of blue for the first like 13 time steps. But after that, it starts separating. So this is the nature of the chaotic dynamical system. So that's what happens in the weather system. So the question is if we can synchronize this red time series by transferring some information from, from this blue time series. So if we transfer the perfect information from this blue to red, then we can make perfectly the <coughs> same time series as blue because we have no error in the model in the process. So um, what we do, what I did is to have some noisy observation so that we have some degraded information transferred to this red time series. So let's see that this blue curves exactly this time series and these circles here are the noisy observation of this um, time series. And then we just tell these uh, noisy 
observations to be spread uh, using the Kalman filter. That's a kind of data simulation method. Um, then we can make this red series closer to, well, on track to this with this uh, blue curve. So this this is how we make this system synchronize with the, the nature. So we assume that blue is the nature. Okay. So so the advantage is that on average, this red is closer to this blue curve than the observation. So the observation noise is larger noise than the error in this red. So that's how we get a better estimate using the data simulation. Okay. So what we did is to predict using this process. That was a simple equation. And then we get the noisy observation and combine them. How do we combine them? So we consider the errors. So this is the Bayesian estimate. So I think that data simulation is all about the errors. So we need to think about the errors. So if we can quantify the errors like this for the forecast and also the observation, then we can combine these two independent information to get some merged information. So that's what the DEA does. Okay, so we consider the errors. So the errors we can describe in a probability density function. So if we have the forecast value here, then this is a probability density. We can write the probability density like that if we know the shape of this probability. And we can do the same thing for the observation. Then what we do is just to multiply these two basically and normalize so that the area will be one. That's the, the action of probability. So we get the better estimate. It's even uh, more accurate than A or B and it's higher probability. So that's what we do. So if we assume the Gaussian PDF, the Gaussian function is like this. So A and B, and we know the sigma, that's the width of this, this Gaussian function. And then we just multiply, then we can compute. So the multiplication of two Gaussian functions will be the Gaussian. So if things are in Gaussian, this, if, if we have a new observation that is Gaussian, then we can do the same thing to get another Gaussian. It's getting narrower, narrower, more accurate. So we have the new estimate for this uh, center value and also the width. So things are Gaussian, if the things are Gaussian, then we can keep all in the Gaussian frame. So that's the beauty of the Gaussianity. Once we have uh, non-Gaussianity, things will be non-Gaussian forever. So that's the real world. But we can as approximate the PDF. The Gaussian approximation works for most variables, not for some variables. Okay, so what we do in numerical weather prediction is that we try to predict this true atmosphere that is unknown. So with some estimate, we can predict, and if we keep forecasting, the forecast will go apart from this nature. So that's the chaotic uh, nature. So once we take the observation, we combine these two to get a better estimate, and then we forecast again, and we repeat this process. This is known as the four-dimensional data simulation, because if we consider this analysis, this is the result of the data simulation of this observation. So this includes this observation. But how did we get this forecast? This forecast coming from this, with this observation. Without this observation, we get the forecast like here. That's what we could do best. And then we never get this. So we get this because of this observation. Otherwise, we have some forecast somewhere there, and we, even if we use this observation, our estimate will be somewhere here or here. So um, that's why we accumulate the observations in time. So the all observations contained and then propagated in time through this model. That's how we use the process-based model. The process can propagate the information, the observed information in time. That's how we get the better estimate, and that's how we make 
we make the weather predictions accurately. Okay, so we have the initial state and simulate the weather or whatever it, system it is. We can simulate and then we get the simulated state combined with the observation through DA to get the best estimate. Okay. So if we open up this uh, black box of DA a little bit, then we can see that we need to match the variable between this and the observation. So this is the model simulation. So we have the variables in the model may not be the same as the observed variable. So if we consider the example that I showed at the beginning, that's the radar reflectivity. The radar reflectivity is the result of the reflecting signal of the radio wave. So the radar emits the radio wave and observes the reflecting signal. We don't simulate the reflecting signal here. So th what we do is to simulate the radar in this simulation world. So this is the modeled atmosphere. So we have the raindrops or other things, uh, temperature, humidity in here. And then we put the radar in the simulation and observe this simulated state. So what we do is to compute the radar reflectivity from this variable to what is observed. So the same for the satellite observation. So we observe the infrared radiances, for example. Then we, ha we have no infrared radiances here. So what we do is to simulate what will be observed if you have this simulated state. So we have a model state and we observe. So we need to simulate the observation, like the radar simulator or, or satellite simulator. So then we can take the difference and we try to minimize the difference through the data simulation process. Okay. So what we can do with data simulation, now we can do many things. So first of all, we can make a good prediction or we can estimate the state. But I, I think that what um, was very important in, in geoscience um, what, uh, about data simulation is what actually Eugenia uh, showed uh, in 90s. So she, she and colleagues at, at EMC made this time series of for the past 40 years of the, the estimate, best estimate of the atmosphere. That changed the whole climate science because the people use those data to understand the climate dynamics and all. So that all started from this application of data simulation. Why that was so uh, powerful? Because of this uh, integrates the various data. So we have satellite observations or many different types of observations, but all fit into this state. And this state is the model variables. The model is designed by humans. So we have very uh, good structure of the data. We have uh, gridded data um, for all variables that we understand. And that is in the, the, this state for the model. But the observations are more random. It, it, um, Different types of observation have different variables to observe, and it's hard to analyze. So we, we can analyze each observation separately, but if we combine all observations together, it's going to be very, very difficult. But this data simulation process can get all the observations into this state. So that's what uh, the reanalysis or the analysis did. So this is really powerful. And I think that's the highest cited paper in, in all geoscience field uh, so because it was so powerful. And we can also now do the model error or bias estimation and correction or the parameter estimation or even model identification. I mean that uh, we can try to minimize the difference so between the observation and the simulation. So what, once we forecast, we can compare with the observation and we, tr we always monitor the differences in data simulation. So this is input to the data simulation. So we, we can identify the systematic differences. And we can, so if the model is imperfect, 
uh, we can add some new term based on this experience. So that's more like the data driven, but the data driven approach can also provide something here. So that's something uh, ongoing uh, recently. Okay, so what we did um, using the K-computer uh, for the next generation um, big data simulation is something like this. So we had the new generation sensor, uh, Himawari 8, that's a geostat new geostationary satellite. And this work was done by Dr. Honda in my group. So Himawari 8 is like this. So the left side is the previous generation, and the right side is the new generation, Himawari 8. And it's more frequent, colorful, and precise, and have, has 50 times more data than the previous generation. This is another new sensor producing orders of magnitude more data. So both of these are the, the generated in the computer. So these are the computer simulations. So we have a typhoon here. This was the strongest typhoon in 2015. It's Typhoon Soudeva. And we have a typhoon structure. But with assimilating Himawari 8, we get these cloud patterns a lot different from this. Okay, so we assimilated all sky infrared variances. And this is the infrared variances observed by Himawari 8. So these two are generated in the computer. Um, so this is a simulation. And also the, the Himawari simulator can simulate this infrared variances. Okay, so, so this is much closer to this. That's good, so it works very well. And every 30 seconds or every 10 minutes data assimilation can make some difference. So we can see slight difference, but it's harder to see the difference. Okay. Um, we have thicker, higher clouds in 10 minute cycle, and that was observed, but less here. Or some ice structure here, it looks differently. And 10 minute cycle is closer to the observation. So the 10 minute cycle means that we, we assimilate the Himawari data every 10 minutes. So this made a lot of difference in the intensity prediction of this tropical cyclone. The tropical cyclone intensity is one of the, the hardest problems in meteorology. So uh, the blue shows the best track. So that's what is analyzed based on the observation. And black is a case without any Himawari data assimilation. And green is every 30 minutes. And red is every 10 minutes. And as you can see that this rapid intensification period made this tropical cyclone the strongest in the year. And we can predict these thin lines are the prediction. The thick lines are the analysis. So the analysis is the result of data simulation. So the prediction provides like 12 hour prediction or longer prediction can provide this accurate intensity prediction compared with the 30 minutes. So the 30 minutes still helps, but not, not quite. So what we found is that this rapid, rapidly updating system really helps um, in this case. We also explored the ensemble simulation of the global weather, but a large ensemble. So we have this 10,240 ensemble members, ensemble karma filter, that's a data simulation. So each individual dot represents the, the atmosphere. And if you look at these six, 16, we can see more similarities in the northern hemisphere, and more differences in the southern hemisphere because we have more data in the northern hemisphere. So why this is important? Because um, we, as I said, data simulation is the theory of errors. And it's important to how to represent the errors. So we represent the errors using the, the samples. So that's the, what the ensemble common filter does. So using 100 samples, 100 members, is a typical choice because uh, one sample requires a full simulation. That's expensive. So usually 100 simulations is expensive enough. And we try to do all the data simulation and the error estimate using the 100 ensemble members. And we, but we still have lots of noise. So this shows 
uh, correlation patterns from this star. The correlation means that if you observe the star, uh, this observation will have an impact like that. And this is like a continental scale or even global scale, and it's spreading out everywhere because of the sampling error. So that's a big trouble in the ensemble common filter, and we have methods to localize this, but then we limit the impact of this observation only surrounding like less than a thousand kilometer area. But this is like 10,000 kilometers away, and we found that this was a surprise to us, but we found that we have a significant correlation even with 10,000 ensemble members that affects 10,000 kilometers away from this observation. So the question is what's the impact of considering that long range correlation? So this shows the root mean scale errors. We have a lot of lines, but we just focus on this black and red. The black is the case with 80 ensemble members. So with 80 ensemble members, we had to localize the impact of the observation within a surrounding area. And that worked very well. And it produced the forecast error growing like that. So this is zero day forecast error, and one day, two day, three day forecast error growing like that. So that's, that's reasonable. And if we have 10,240 ensemble members, like this red curve, we remove the localization because uh, we have large enough ensemble. So the sampling error is negligible. And then we get this red curve. So this forecast error, one day forecast error, is equivalent to five day forecast error. So this is an idealized experiment. So this doesn't tell us that in the real world, if we afford, if we run 10,240 members, uh, we may not get this much advantage. But still, even for the idealized case, we get this um, huge impact to extend our predictability. So that, that was our surprise. And this was uh, published in this uh, IEEE journal computer uh, as a cover feature. So if you're interested in more details, it's a November 15 uh, issue, the big ensemble data simulation in numerical weather prediction. This was part of our big data simulation efforts. Okay, so what we have been exploring so far is to combine the big data from the real world with the big simulation. So we push the, all the limits in numerical weather prediction, that one is the ensemble size. We tested two orders of magnitude more ensemble size. And rapid update is 30 second update. Usually hourly update is 120 times more rapid. And also high resolution. Usually it's one kilometer resolution considered as a high resolution mesoscale weather prediction. And we did a 100 meter that has 100 times more uh, horizontal grid points. So all of these are two orders of magnitude more than the current uh, system to explore the future numerical weather prediction. So the most recent achievement are related to this um, timeliness. So we explored how to improve the forecast accuracy, but also the computer speed. So we had a system to update every 30 seconds. We need to show that our computation is completed within 30 seconds. At first, when we developed, we, we developed the system in 2016, it took an hour, more than an hour, actually. It failed within an hour, so it took more than an hour. And then after one month of the development, we accelerated quite, quite a bit. And in 2016, we achieved about 10 minutes. But we needed to com complete the computation within 30 seconds. But 10 minutes is too slow. It's still 20 times slower than the goal. So the last year, we spent quite a bit of effort to improve the computational time. So with a 100 meter mesh, we reached like 70 or 80 seconds. That's still slow. So we decided to degrade the resolution to 250. And finally, we reached this 30 seconds. So this is a 30 seconds. The 30 seconds is only here, here. But uh, on the right, the last year in June, uh, we computed this uh, within 30 seconds. So the question is if 250 meters is good. So we compare the forecast at 250 meters or 100 meters. 
this is the actual observation. So this is the analysis. The analysis looks similar. Five minutes forecast, 10 minutes, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes forecast. So we would like to run the 30 minutes forecast at this moment. So this is the longest forecast. And well, we see some differences. They are missing small, uh, well, details and also some uh, differences, but not a major difference. So we are happy with this. Uh, we can do this prediction at 250 meter resolution every 30 second update real time. So that's what we, we proved. Good. So for every 30 second update, uh, we cannot use the K-computer real time because uh, K-computer is not the dedicated machine for the weather prediction. So what we did is this uh, simple system, the now casting. But this is a three-dimensional now casting that we consider the dropping um, motions or the ascending motions. So this produces uh, the time series like this. So it just moves. But this has a skill for the 10 minutes period. So we now have this system real time. And using this smartphone app, with uh, MTI, that's a private company developing this uh, smartphone app. Um, it's already 150,000 downloads, and uh, people are really using in those areas. So it's nice. And this has a skill compared with the persistence, of course. The persistence is just, it doesn't move. So just moving it can make a lot of impact. This is a threat score. Threat score is always higher. So 10 millimeter per hour or 30 millimeter per hour is higher than the persistence. So, so this has a skill. And we get the feedback from the users, and those are good. OK, so we try to improve this system using the current, well, the recent um, advance of machine learning technique. So this is a kind of a deep learning method, a convolutional uh, long short-term memory, the LSTM. And we applied this uh, convolutional LSTM to this data. Well, I will not go into detail. But uh, this is a combination of two types of uh, neural network structure. One is a convolutional neural network, and the other is LSTM. The LSTM takes the data in time series, so it, it, it fits well into the time series uh, prediction. So we feed, feed the data, like time series data, and then uh, we predict, we output the time series data. So that's what the convolutional LSTM does. And so in this case, we split the area. Yeah, we split the whole area into the small areas to increase the sampling size. And we apply this. So this is, this shows basically the advantage of this LSTM. So this is the actual observation. And this is the optical flow. The optical flow is just, just a motion. And the LSTM is the neural network. And this predicts 30, 30 seconds, one minute. And you can see the clear difference between these two. And these are similar. So that what happens was disappearing. So this, this rain, so this is a vertical section. It's dropping and disappearing. So it's disappearing. But the optical flow can just propagate. So the LSTM can capture it from the data. And it has clearly the better match between these two than this. And we have statistically significant improvement by using the LSTM. So we try to improve this now casting system using this uh, machine learning technique. So this is the, the future plan. So we actually have finished this big data simulation effort for the past five and a half years. So this March is the end of the, the period of this uh, project. And then uh, we get the next three year extension uh, based on our achievements. Um, they continue funding us uh, to extend our research. So this is a picture. So the idea is to synchronize the cyberspace with the real world. So we get the data <laughs> from the real world through the advanced sensing technology, and we get it in the cyberspace and synchronize with this simulation. And we try to incorporate the advanced um, artificial intelligence uh, te technologies. So it's really advancing rapidly. So we 
I think it's reasonable to think about uh, make well taking advantage of those advances into here, and also we try to address the control problem. So the eventual goal of the weather prediction is to minimize the impacts from the weather, or, or yeah, we take advantage of the weather situation for a better life or the better economic activities. So we have some activities in the real world that we can uh, simulate, not exactly, but we can simulate the situations depending on the weather uh, scenarios so we can have an uncertain forecast and we can control ourselves. That means that we make the choice, the better choice to optimize our activities. So that's a broader scope. So let me, so do I have time? Five minutes, okay. Uh, so for the broader picture, so the weather prediction is just a kind of prediction. So we would like to predict many things. That's why still people are using this method, but it's not scientific. So we would like to make predictions based on the science. So that's the concept of the predictive science, or the, what we call prediction science. So what science has achieved is like these things. So these are the, based on the prediction based on science. So for example, this type of prediction is based on the deductive um, approach. So it's based on the model. Um, the computational science, which is known as a third science, can make the prediction. Or the other type of prediction is the inductive approach. So it's based on experience data. That's what we do, the humans are doing, actually. And now the data science is, is evolving quickly. And this is a good example that, that this uh, method is very successful. There are many other examples too. So we have two methods for the prediction. And data simulation, as I said, combines these two approaches. So we can make better prediction and control. So data simulation has evolved in meteorology and, and earth science, planetary sciences. But now it's expanding to different fields like social science or engineering or biology, medical sciences, and other fields too. So I have been seeing this uh, expansion of the application of data simulation because I saw uh, many studies um, at the supercomputing center, at the flagship supercomputing center in Japan. And there are many people using the supercomputer. So what they do is a simulation. But once they have a better simulation, they look at the real nature and co try to compare. So that's the entrance to data simulation. Um, what happened in meteorology is exactly like that. So I think that we can follow the approach that we did, we developed in meteorology can be applied to many different fields. So uh, we have been working on bringing data simulation into new areas. One example is this. So we have um, trees growing in the model. So we have a process-based model so that the tree is growing. So this is a 100-year simulation of trees. And we have the satellite observation. Like MODIS gives us a leaf area index every four days. So we <coughs> set up the model in this Siberia, and this is a data simulation, and that worked very well. So this was published, so if you are interested, you could look at this paper. But this almost exactly the same. That means that we have this forest state in each individual tree matching with this observation. So the goal of this project is to simulate the trees all over the world. That sounds crazy, but it may be interesting. And another completely different um, example is this press forming. As you can see that we have some metal iron board, and we put something, push, and change the shape. So this is a deformation process. And we have a model to simulate, but this cannot simulate very well for this type of uh, realistic um, estimation. So when we form, press form these parts in a car, uh, we have these problems. So we need to predict 
how much to spring back after the, what's the final shape. So if you have this type of cracking problem, it, it, it will not be useful. So uh, we would like to predict, but it's, it's difficult. So what, what the automakers do is to experiment again and again. So they, well, they do a lot of different types of the stress forming experiments. And finally, they have the final solution. So if we can do the accurate simulation, we can avoid all the experiments, and we can do only a few experiments to make it make sure that it works. So that, that's something that we have been working. Maybe I, I skip this part. OK. So th this is what we call the fifth paradigm. Because uh, as I said, this is the third science, that's the computational science, and the data science is the fourth science. So we can make the combination of these to bring the new paradigm in the science. So with that, I have been working with, for example, uh, Dr. Seita, he's a medical doctor, and he tried to develop a system to predict the health and disease of a specific person, um, like predicting the hurricane track. So <laughs> if we leave Leads this life, then we stay in health, or we get a disease or something, so that we can control our our yeah habit or something to make make us more healthy. So the problem here is that we have no good model, process-based model for the human health. So it's too complex. That's a typical uh, problem, but uh, we can use some data-driven methods to to build the time evolution evolution model. So data the problem of data-driven model is that it's a black box. We don't understand the process. But uh, we can do this type of uh, whole life um, prediction purely data-driven. That kind of research is, is ongoing. But the problem is that it's really difficult to communicate with patients and convince them. Because uh, we cannot just say that we have we have the black box. The a artificial intelligence suggests that you shouldn't drink now or something. So the patient will not believe that because it's just uh, artificial intelligence says, but it may be wrong. So we would like to open up those black box as much as possible. And this is what uh, Dr. Seita was thinking, to combine the idea of data simulation. We call it hybrid. Um, because this is a data-driven evolution model, and we have a regular data simulation taking the data to adapt to the current situation of this person. And he's a medical doctor, and, and he, he thinks that this can be more uh, convincing to the patient. So we have been working on this type of problem. So as I said, there are scientific paradigms um, evolving like this. At first, we studied from the experimental science. And then, uh, based on those experiences, we built, we extract the basic theory that started the theoretical science. The theoretical science evolved as it is, uh, but the computational science can produce even um, virtual experience. So that started the new paradigm of the science. And now it's the era of big data or Internet of Things or artificial intelligence. So we have a data-centric science. So that, that's something we get from the experience and combined with the computational science. So that's the fourth paradigm. So now uh, we are proposing that the next paradigm should be the predictive science. OK, so thank you very much for your attention. So um, I think the next, next big advancement 
uh, may be caused by merging the traditional approaches with uh, the new machine learning or deep learning techniques. And the, the climate modeling, for that, that's a difficult question because we have uh, not a good data set for the past uh, long climate period. But um, we have uh, imperfect model for the climate simulation. Then we can fill in the gaps, the model errors, using the data that we have. So that even though we don't understand the process, we could create the process based on the data. So that's somewhat related to the hybrid or this uh, human life uh, problem. So we, we have imperfect understanding of the process. So we cannot derive the equation for what we don't understand. But we can derive, well, we can get something from the data. So that can help improve the climate modeling. Okay. That's true. So uh, eventually, I think it's important to observe well. But uh, without observation, we can play with those, act well, we can make a lot of ensembles, basically, uh, for different activities in the deep ocean. And that will make the difference in the surface. If there is no difference in the surface, it's not important. But I think that it eventually comes up to the surface and makes a difference. So then we can understand the process based on many um, ensemble simulations. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, not the forecast because we cannot afford. But uh, this, the case of the, the rain prediction, if we said well, too much to go back, but uh, that, that case is um, the model error is a severe problem. So we cannot get a good forecast at that resolution. The, the physics uh, we use was developed for one kilometer resolution. And we just uh, make the, the higher resolution model. So, so the physics is not designed for that resolution. Right. 
Yes, yes, exactly. I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. uh, I think Good we one. have time for a couple of questions. If if there are any more. There is one online question from the uh, remote audience. Uh, he's asking. Uh, his question is: Assuming that CNN and RNN deep learning prediction system is well trained, um, the DL prediction will take only a few seconds. Then would it be necessary to have the 100k 10k uh, member ensemble data assimilation? Uh, then requires yeah, the yeah, fast I, supercomputer. I Ah, okay. So the deep learning prediction is fast computationally. Uh, so ten thousand ensemble DA. So it's a so ten thousand member ensemble DA is not a deep learning. So it's a process based model. So we. So 10,000 ensemble members is just to explore what's, what's the impact of having 10,000 ensemble members and also what's the error structure that we can get. So that's a different uh, goal for that research. Yeah, she, she was saying that the goal was what? The wrong goal. No, um, she mixed the deep learning ah. uh, prediction and 10,000 ensemble member research yeah okay i think we are running out of uh, uh, questions also so let's thank you very much thank you very much Thank <laughs> you. 